If the last year has taught us anything, it's that COVID-19 has changed our world forever. That's especially true in the area of human resources. Our next presentation is a small two-person panel to talk about the future of human resources in our industry. Our two presenters are David Barron of Cozen O'Connor and Quinn Gonzalez of QMG Global. David is a shareholder at the Houston office of Cozen O'Connor. David partners with clients to offer practical solutions to labor and employment problems of all sizes and shapes before they end up in litigation. That might mean helping a human resource professional with a complicated disciplinary action or helping a Fortune 500 CEO respond to a union campaign. David understands his clients' businesses and works tirelessly and create creatively to make a client's goal his goal. Because of David's common sense approach to labor and employment issues, he is often quoted in newspapers and magazines. He has also appeared as an employment law professional on talk radio and local CBS and Fox affiliates. David is board certified in labor and employment law by the state of Texas and has been named a Texas super lawyer rising star by Texas Monthly Magazine. Thanks, Joe. I guess we're ready to go. <laughs> um, we appreciate the opportunity to present today. I'm, I'm also joined with uh, Quinn Gonzalez, and we will be uh, talking about uh, various HR issues today. I want to start with uh, a discussion about um, COVID, really, because that's the elephant in the room, right? I mean, that's been the overarching HR issue for the entire year. Um, so we're going to do a quick, I'm going to do a quick sort of rundown of what's going on in that area in terms of laws and regulations. And then we're going to break out into a panel and Quinn and I are going to kick around um, a number of topics, um, and including COVID, of course, but also some other things like incentives and absenteeism policies and uh, diversity inclusion, which is really an important issue as well um, right now. So So let's start with um, COVID. Um, you know, one issue that continues to be a really hot topic is um, you know, what to do with employees who are either um, exposed or who are sick, right? So we have kids back in school. And, and the one issue that I keep seeing with my clients is, you know, um, you get those emails or notes from school that says your child has been exposed at school, someone in their class. And then we, we have issues with maybe the family or the parents have to also quarantine. And we have this sort of never ending uh, round robin of people having to quarantine. Um, and then also as you know, we're sort of in the midst of a spike, which is now thankfully coming down, obviously we have employees who are also getting sick. So um, the guidelines have actually evolved and changed over time. So I thought it'd be helpful to you know, provide an update of where we're at on that. Um, so there's two things that you should be aware of. One is a quarantine, which is when someone's exposed, but not actually sick or tested positive. Um, and then also isolation, which is when someone has tested positive. So the latest from the CDC on quarantine requirements, it used to be 14 days, and you can still certainly do that. And some states and, and localities still have the 14 rule. But, but the CDC has actually shortened that to, to 10 um, without testing or actually after day seven. So that's the fastest way you could get an employee back would be seven days. If there's a negative test result um, and that test occurred on day five or later, the idea there is you want to have a few days to, to make sure that if the person is tested, you, you have a good test. So that, that's basically the, the standard right now for getting someone back to work as fast as possible um, if they've been ex, um, potentially exposed, but not actually sick. Um, for someone who is, is actually sick or tested positive, we call that isolation. Um, again, we had the 14 day rule that's been um, reduced somewhat to uh, 10 days after the positive test if there's no symptoms. Um, and obviously the, the person has to be symptom free before coming back without medication, you know, even reducing drugs and those kinds of things. So we're effectively down from 14 days to 10 days now, which is you know, somewhat better than the 14 days that we had before. Again, these are guidelines. You can do something different if you want. And some states and localities, uh, not in Texas, but outside of Texas do have still the 14 day requirement. So you should make sure that you're following that. Um, Another hot topic um, that we may get questions on today, so I wanted to go over it, is um, you know, what, what to do with pay for people who are subject to these quarantines and isolations. And you know, we had the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was passed in March of 2020, um, which created for the first time paid sick leave on a federal level. We've never had that before. Um, also paid um, family and medical leave. 
Um, in Texas, most of the schools are now open, so we really haven't had any, any lingering issues with the paid FMLA. Um, we continue to see you know, a lot of issues with paid sick leave. That law expired at the end of um, last year, but it was on a voluntary basis um, extended. So what that means is as an employer, you can choose to continue to, to provide this benefit or not. It's up to you as an employer. You could also choose, for example, to only continue the two weeks of emergency paid sick leave and not do or participate in the uh, up to 12 weeks of emergency family and medical leave, which a lot of my clients have done that. Um, you only get the tax credit, however, once per employee for this entire period. So if the person, if the employee has already taken a two week uh, emergency paid sick leave back in 2020, they don't get another one for 2021. We don't know what's gonna happen after March. Um, there's talk of the Biden administration coming up with something to extend that, but we, we don't really know at this point whether that will be extended on a, maybe a continued voluntary basis or something more permanent. Um, you know, I think the answer there is just stay tuned. Um, the, the sort of the topic right now, the hot topic is what to do with vaccines. And that's something we'll, we'll chat about here in a minute on the round table. Um, the big question being, can you mandate? Should you mandate? Um, you know, if you're not gonna mandate, what sort of incentives should you put in place? Um, I will tell you that the vast majority of companies that I talk to, and I've talked to a lot across lots of different industries, including manufacturing and food processing, um, many companies want a mandate and think it's a, it, it's, it's a necessary step, but many are not at this point for a number of reasons. Uh, legal risks is pretty high on that list. Also, um, you know, most of the states are not at a, at a position to effectively have vaccines widely available, especially for younger um, workers. Um, Texas and most states are not yet at the phase for essential workers. Um, we're just not there yet. Um, Texas is doing, you know, over 65 and uh, certain medical um, employees and, and persons with, with uh, medical underlying medical conditions. So we're just not at a point now where on a widespread basis, people in, in, in our industries have access to um, vaccines. Um, so I think that's, we're still a little bit away from that point. Um, and there's also some pretty significant legal concerns about whether um, whether it be lawful. Um, the EOC has weighed in on um, its view, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's the agency that deals with discrimination laws. They've said, um, you know, if you're going to do this, that it would have to provide exceptions for uh, religious objections and also medical objections. And those are pretty big exceptions. So the, the EOC did not wrestle with state law issues Again, there's a lot of states. Uh, Texas is pretty pro-employer, so I'm not too worried about Texas, but there are some states that have you know, very significant exceptions to employment at will and, and have wrongful termination claims that are different than in Texas. Um, and because of the emergency use authorization nature of this vaccine, I think that opens up a lot of questions about whether an employer can compel someone to take an emergency drug that as a matter of federal law, federal law says you have the right to refuse um, anything that's been approved only on emergency use authorization. So that's a very controversial question that we really don't have any guidance yet. Um, the EOC also has said that an employer has the right to ask for proof of vaccination. So if you want to provide an incentive, uh, many companies have already announced incentives. Kroger has announced, I think, $100 um, for each employee that's vaccinated. Memorial Hermann uh, he uh, Health System in Houston has done the same thing, Dollar General. So that's, that's becoming a very common thing for companies to do, which I think is lawful. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th those are other options um, as well. Um, some other things to think about in terms of incentivizing. Um, if you have a wellness plan, you could incorporate this under your wellness plan, providing paid or, or, or approved unpaid time off for people to go and, and get vaccinated. You know, those are all really good options um, to think about if you don't want to mandate, but perhaps we're just going to strongly encourage. The other thing I would say is uh, helping employees with the education process, where to go, how to sign up. Right now, it's not very easy and, and clear, and it's different from county to county. So helping employees with that, um, I, I think, is a, is a good first step. Um, you know, if you, if you don't want to mandate or you're not there yet, um, you know, that, that's going to be really helpful to help people, you know, navigate that, that complicated process. Um, just a, a, a sort of a legal note as a lawyer, if you do pay people, if you do provide incentives, keep in mind that, you know, that obviously it creates potential issues on is it taxable as wages? Is it going to be included 
um, in the regular rate for overtime purposes. You know, depending on how you do that, you want to get some help from from legal on, on how to treat that payment. Um, last thing I want to talk about before we open it up to the panel is, um, you know, OSHA is not uh, going away. In fact, under the Biden administration, OSHA is probably going to ramp up enforcement in this area. OSHA really hasn't done a lot of enforcement uh, on COVID under the Trump administration. So we know now that Bi Biden has ordered OSHA to, um, to come up with an emergency standard. Um, we've, so far, we've had guidelines, which are not binding. They're just guidelines. We're about to have an actual standard uh, starting next month on COVID, um, which will be something that employers can be fined if they don't comply with that emergency standard. So um, some things to be looking out there out for in, under that standard. Um, you're going to have to have a risk assessment and action plan. Um, it's also going to you know, require masking even after employee vaccinations. That jumped out at me as something that I think might be a little surprising to employers. I know everybody's hoping to get back to normal. Um, and you know, I think you know, when we talk about it in a minute about what's the future here, um, I suspect that these OSHA emergency standards are going to keep a lot of the PPE requirements in place even after employees are, are um, vaccinated. Also keep in mind that we have this continuing obligation to um, analyze each case of an employee who, who develops COVID and determine doing our own assessment as to whether that happened in the workplace. If it's more likely than not that that employee contracted COVID in the workplace, we have an obligation to report that on our OSHA 300 log. So um, you know, we need to be having um, documentation as to what investigation we've done, show our due diligence, uh, especially if we don't log it. So. Um, that, that obligation also is not going away. All right, um, I guess with that, I know I've been talking for a while. I'm gonna let uh, Quinn jump in here. Um, uh, you know, Quinn, what, what are your thoughts on COVID and um, sort of the lingering impact of the pandemic on the workplace? Before we let before we let Quinn jump in, let me properly introduce her. I was supposed to do that, <laughs> I was supposed to do that at the beginning when I introduced you, David, and uh, I, I dropped the ball on that. So let me, let's let me tell everyone who Quinn is, and then we'll get you guys going. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Quinn Gonzalez is the man is the founder and managing partner at QMG Global, a human resources and operations consulting firm specializing in people and process improvements. Since its inception, QMG has contributed to the success of various organizations in the areas of talent acquisition and retention, compliance, benefits and compensation, due diligence in mergers and acquisitions, and deployment of lean manufacturing and Six Sigma initiatives. Quinn has over 20 years of experience working in midsize and Fortune 500 companies, successfully transforming organizational culture, executing and driving strategic and tactical HR programs and practices for multi-site manufacturing organizations in oil and gas, retail, food, and healthcare. Okay, Quinn. Now you can. Now you guys can take it. Take it away. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, thank you, David. That was a really informative discussion on COVID and how it's impacting uh, us in the workplace today. And from what I can see, as far as lingering and in, uh, permanent impact of the pandemic, of course, um, you know, with the risk assessment uh, required by OSHA and also um, things that are happening as far as absenteeism is, is a major driving point. So when we talk about absenteeism, um, what we're noticing in the workplace, particularly um, in more food processing is um, you know, contact tracing. So when we see individuals out on the, the, um, the shop floor or so forth, working out on the line and you know, they're compartmentalized, but you know, when, when somebody gets sick or, or tests positive for COVID, um, what we've typically seen is that um, the, that individual is being sent home. And you know, ideally you would also send those individuals who are in close contact with, with that, that person uh, home as well to be quarantined and then tested. Um, however, we're, we're, because of production requirements and, and whatnot, we're not seeing a whole lot of that happen. And so I think that's that's one of a, a you know a big issue that we're seeing out there. And and David, are are you hearing anything on on those grounds as far as you know not following those types of policies? You know, you have all these great guidelines and things that you should implement and follow, but for whatever reason, it's not being done. Yeah, I think you know what many employers have tried to do is to create systems and procedures where people are not in, in prolonged close contact, right? So you don't have to do as much contact tracing if you set up procedures where they're not in close contact. So for example, 
you know, many employers have sort of outlawed the communal, um, you know, break rooms. You know, you can't all get together and eat lunch at the same time. You're not supposed to all be outside smoke on smoke breaks. All the, the things that employees would normally do to congregate tried to, you know, get rid of those things so that if there are people, um, you know, close to each other, they're masked up. And, you know, if everyone's following the rules, we have less of that need to, you know, when one person gets sick, now we have to send home, you know, six people or seven people. Um, the problem is, is employees don't always follow the rules. And, you know, not all systems can be set up to where you're not close to each other. I mean, some lines just can't, you know, you, it's unavoidable because of the close proximity that people have to work together. So, you know, even the best of systems don't always get followed. Right. And, and you know, um, along those lines, as far as, you know, the absenteeism, we need to find individuals to put them in place uh, as far as backup uh, individuals. So we're seeing a lot of cross-training uh, in terms of individual skill set. And so just, you know, kind of moving to the next topic as far as um, incentives um, along those lines. We're seeing employers um, putting in additional skills uh, incentives um, to uh, provide cross-training to help individuals grow in skills and to provide a replacement or backup should individuals be, you know, have to quarantine. Um, and then, uh, you know, also with COVID, we're seeing a lot of different um, work models. So we're seeing a lot of remote work, uh, work from home. Um, and then, of course, there's individuals that have to be there. And then there's also some kind of um, combination of working from home and coming to the office a couple of times a week. Um, so it's, it's really dependent on the organization and what's best for them as far as how to address the type of work model that uh, COVID has impacted the workplace. Um, but, you know, uh, looking at those models too, uh, when you're working remotely and working from home, as we've seen in the last year, we're also seeing um, an increase of, uh, I guess, um, you know, mental health issues that have come up uh, because employees have been isolated for those individuals that have been working from home and not having that human contact and interaction. Um, so, you know, mental um, health issues is something that we're seeing as an issue that has come up. Um, and, and also, you know, um, the, the type of the, the different groups of individuals who are working in the workplace, specifically in the meat industry, you're seeing a lot of, you know, women who are working out there on the floor. And so with that, women are typically the care, caretakers of the family. And with COVID having been impacted, you're seeing a lot of these female workers being out. So, you, you know, we have to recognize that as, as a big part of what's happening in, in the workplace. And so, you know, we have to address the child care issues and so also provide incentives as far as how we deal with those types of absenteeism and, and, and workers. Yeah, I think the working from home issue is, is a big one because I think that's a shift. If you ask me, what's the one thing that probably will never go back to normal? Um, in the workplace, and that's that's really high on my list. I mean, if not number one, I you know, especially in more white collar office type jobs. You know, obviously meat production, many of those jobs you just can't perform from home. But um, jobs that now where people have done those jobs from home for a year, it's going to be tough getting those folks, at least some of them, you know, back into the office. And I mean, I'm a, I'm in a law firm, so of course, you know, we're we're <laughs> it's it's hard getting uh, lawyers back in the office. Um, so I, I think that's a shift that's really going to endure um, in the workplace. And it's going to create legal issues because some people, some companies are going to want people to come back and they're not going to want to come back. And, um, you know, we're going to be wrestling with, um, you know, what's the, is there a legal reason why people could refuse to stay out? I mean, right now with COVID, you know, there are potentially, you know, issues there with people who are at risk um, or older and, and maybe that create safety issues for them to come into the workplace. But as vaccinations become more readily available, I think those risks go down and that accommodation analysis maybe favors the employer more than the employee. I mean, right now, legally, it's hard to tell an employee, yes, you have to come into work if they've got a doctor's note or they've got a safety reason why you know, they, they argue that's um, you know, something that should be accommodated. Um, I, I think that, that, that balancing act might change a little bit um, once vaccination becomes more available. A couple other thoughts on working from home. Um, one sort of pitfall that I've seen is people are really spreading out, um, you know, because you can work from anywhere. So you may have employees working from Alaska and Montana or New York or California, and you may not even know it. So it's really important that you have some sort of policy or guidelines or even just an email 
to people who are working remotely so you know where they're working so that if they're creating legal issues for you, if that person is working somewhere in a different state, some states after a certain period of time, you have to start paying state income taxes and, and things like that. So you don't want your employees to suddenly create a California office and have you not know about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another thing that we're, we're seeing out there uh, with, with you know, switching over to recruiting is that um, it, it used to be that um, you know, individuals, companies, and organizations, um, specifically in food, you know, always looking for individuals with the type of industry experience um, as far as having been worked in the environment. But you know, nowadays, we're, when talking with employers about recruiting, you know, we have to also bring up the fact that um, it's, it's, it's kind of a tight market out there with COVID too. Um, you know, it's, in, in, and also um, kind of jumping ahead, David, with diversity and inclusion, um, we have to take a look at the different types of candidates and not being so much, you know, of a fit uh, candidate who actually fits um, the type of prototype into this organization, but one who could possibly have potentials and skill sets that are transferable. Um, because when you take a look at the different positions and opportunities out there, um, so for human resources, for example, I mean, is, is it really necessary for somebody to have worked in a food background? Because when you take a look at the laws, they apply, um, you know, everywhere, whether it be in manufacturing and healthcare or whatnot. But, um, you know, but a lot of, of organizations are still requiring, you know, same industry experience or, you know, even um, individuals who, uh, who, who, who fit, uh, um, I guess, in a mold that they're looking for. So now we're kind of having to switch to look at potential and transferable um, skill sets into different organizations. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, some of the things you said are really important. You know, flexibility, creativity, you know, the, the companies that I've seen that are doing really well are the ones that are very flexible. I mean, the, if the last year and a half has taught us anything, it's that things are changing very, very rapidly. If, if you're stuck in the way things were done and, you know, five years ago, it's going to be hard. Um, so I think flexibility, creativity, you know, um, ad adaptation are really, really important in this environment, especially in regards to things like recruiting. Um, you know, companies should be using social media to recruit. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways out there to recruit people for jobs. Um, we're in a very mobile um, society right now. I mean, you know, all, all of the data tells us that people are leaving cities. Uh, real estate prices are skyrocketing in, in, in more rural areas because people are figuring out I can work anywhere. So, you know, you, you may have people that are more willing to move to places where, you know, where a facility might be where they weren't willing to do that because, you know, real estate's cheaper or whatnot. So I think, you know, there's there's opportunities here that there's definitely issues and problems associated with COVID, but all of that change also creates opportunities for companies that are, you know, um, can adapt and, and maybe take advantage of those, of those things. So I, I think that's kind of a, an interesting time to be, to be, you know, doing the, this work. Right. And, and especially going back to remote working, you know, a lot of these opportunities and, and positions that used to be office required have now shifted to where you know, are you able to offer um, the, the candidate remote work or some combination of that as, as an incentive to attract them as well. Right. And maybe at, at a, a, a less a price point, right? I mean, you may not have been able to afford somebody who had certain skills um, before, but if you're going to now provide that flexibility, you, you may have a whole world of candidates that opens up to you. If you can, you know, you're, you're not just looking for the best in your town or in your area. Now you're looking for someone who has these skills, you know, in the country. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a really interesting way to look at it. And, and I completely agree because that's exactly what we're seeing out there today. Yeah. So let's talk about diversity inclusion. I mean, I, this is a really important topic we've seen. Obviously, the last year and a half has been crazy with respect to COVID, but it's really also been a transformative year with respect to Black Lives Matter and a lot of social justice issues. And, and really right before that, we had Me Too. So we went from Me Too to Black Lives Matters, you know, pretty much, you know, back to back. And, you know, I can tell you what I've seen is, um, you know, a lot of pressure on companies to address these issues. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I would have never had a company that called me up and said, I've had a group of employees put together a list of demands and sent the CEO a letter. I mean, that wouldn't have happened. Whereas now that's fairly common, certainly not out of the ordinary to see demonstrations and things at work. 
Um, and, and I think there's two issues here. One is the diversity and inclusion issue, which is really important. And I think the other issue that I want to make sure everybody thinks about coming out of this pandemic, because hopefully we're on the downslide now, um, is what what that's going to mean for union organizing. We, you know, we've been in an environment for a long, long time where, especially in Texas, we have not really had to worry too much about union organizing. And in the past, unions have really focused on wages and benefits as their hook to get into uh, organize a facility. I believe the future of union organizing is going to be around safety and social justice issues. I think, especially with younger workers, that's going to be a much more um, palatable message. And I think they should really think about, you know, how they've handled COVID, how they're going to continue to handle COVID, um, and also how they're handling these social justice issues, because, you know, that's that's a, that's a way for, for you know, not only employees to get mobilized to to take action, but also unions to come in from the outside and to and force action. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, with um, with all these lingering issues out there with with social justice, what we're seeing is. Um, uh, groups getting together and voicing their opinions and, and, and uh, you know, um, so when a union uh, comes in, when is it a point, David, when it's it's not, um, I guess, them coming together to form some kind of, of group to, I guess, how can an employer um, stop that or, or whether they can or not? So two things. One is that the, the laws protect both informal groups and unions. So if you had a group of employees that complained about something, whether it's safety during the pandemic or social justice issues in the workplace, um, they have the same protections from retaliation, whether there's a union in the mix or not. So that's, that's an important thing for employers to understand. Um, and then in terms of, you know, again, most of my clients would prefer not to be unionized for various reasons and, I'll, and all that. But I mean, basically, you know, the they would prefer to, to manage their own business directly with employees and they feel like that's the best model. Um, and you know, the way to do that, frankly, is to have that good communication with your employees, you know, to have that line of communications and have employees feel like that they're being heard and that they don't need to go to an outside third party. So you know, I think it just goes back to what are you doing to talk with your employees so that they feel like they're being heard on various issues. I mean, obviously safety is a big one, but diversity and inclusion is, is another one. Um, you know, do you create a diversity committee? Many companies have safety committees, right? That are, have representation from not just management, but ha have employee representation on a safety committee. Um, you know, many companies now are moving towards diversity committees using that same model where you have employees are allowed to, to raise issues and have input on, on issues in the workplace that they feel like, you know, they, they wanna be heard on. Mm -hmm. And and one thing I, I do want to stress there's there's a difference between diversity and inclusion although we, we you know tend to speak of those two interactively but diversity of course is is the different groups that we have out there and the inclusion part of it is being able to um, have uh, to welcome those individuals and make them feel like they're part of the team. So when we're talking about diversity and inclusion in the workplace, you know, um, some of the things that we look at, of course, is the culture of the company and communication is a big part of that. Uh, with diversity and inclusion initiative, you, you need to have the, the top level support. Um, and not only that, you know, um, one of the things we're seeing is that not only a diversity committee, but you have um, specific positions like a diversity and uh, inclusion officer or coordinator or what, you know, those types of decisions um, popping up more frequently in the workplace to be the ones who take a look at these issues specifically. Um, and, and with that, you know, it's, it's working through the communication to have the support not only from the top, but from the bottom to include and, and make sure that every group out there has a voice um, and be able to express their concerns and also be respectful of the different um, um, the differences between uh, different groups and different people. Um, so, you know, those, those are the types of things that we're seeing, um, you know, different programs that specifically recognize um, the various groups and cultures out there. And also, you know, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion with respect to hiring as well, we wanna make sure that the workforce resembles the communities that the company or organization is in. Um, and so hiring, uh, when you're looking at diversity, is, is taking a look to make sure that you have representation um, in your company, not only at the uh, first line, but also as you move up towards management, because that's a big issue as well. 
Yeah, and if anybody is, if, if anyone is a government contractor, you know, the world's probably about to change on that front, right? We have a new administration. The last administration um, didn't um, pay a lot of attention to this. I think this new administration is going to be very aggressive. You know, OFCCP, which is the agency that manages federal contractors, already requires affirmative action plans um, and does audits. I think, you know, those level, that level of enforcement is probably going to increase. I wouldn't be shocked to see some new executive orders that address government contractors and what they're should be doing in this area. Um, if you're not already doing, for example, you know, training for managers uh, and employees on, uh, you know, harassment, discrimination, EEO, diversity types of issues, <clears throat> I think that should be, you know, something that you strongly consider. Some states already will require that. Again, Texas is not one of them, but I think it's a good practice. And you know, if you're if you're going to have a manager or someone that's involved in, a, in an issue, you want them to be able to say. You know, I've been trained and I understand the policy and, and you know, the company takes it seriously. So I think training is, is should be really high on the list of, you know, of things to do. Yeah, and, and that goes along the lines of promoting the company's culture and brand as well um, to be an effective company out there. Um, I know we have a few minutes, Joe. I don't know if we have a bunch of questions or not. Uh, um, it would now be a good opportunity to open that up. Yes, we do have a few questions uh, waiting in the queue right now. Are y'all are y'all ready for questions? Sure. Okay. Quinn, you ready? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, sure. Okay. The CDC just endorsed double mask. Do you see double mask being being sorry becoming a requirement? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I think we'll watch what OSHA does. I mean, we have we have the OSHA standard that's coming out next month. I don't anticipate that it's going to require double masks. Um, my my best bet is that it's just one of those guidelines that that's out there that's a best practice potentially, but won't be a requirement. I mean, face shields is a whole nother. I mean, you know, the the meatpacking industry has really kind of been through the ringer on this. I mean, you know, there's been questions over, you know, face shields versus face masks versus double masks. Um, you know, for the most part, the, you know, OSHA has said, you know, as an employer, you should assess your workplace. I mean, there's pros and cons of both. Um, you know, each, every workplace is different in terms of things like humidity and jobs. And they've, they've kind of left it up to the employer to make those types of very specific calls. Um, so I think that's probably what will happen in the future as well. Next question, what do you see the Biden administration requiring with OSHA for companies to follow contact tracing measures? This becoming mandatory? Yes, I think so. So if you look at what OSHA has said that it wants employers to do in the form of guidelines, um, basically what that requires is for a company to have a uh, risk assessment plan and an action plan of what to do if there's a you know positive case or whatnot. Um, pretty much all of those guidelines include contact tracing. Um, I mean that that's a best practice that I think is in you know everything from the CDC to OSHA's recommendations. We are going to see a standard next month, um, which will then be again binding and, and an employer can be fined if they don't comply with that. Um, I, I would say yes. I think that standard is going to require a plan. Um, and that plan is going to have to include um, contact tracing. Gwen, do you, you have any thoughts on that? No, I completely agree. You know, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, contact tracing is pretty critical out there right now. Although, you know, um, some it's it's not always being followed, but it's critical to have um, because, uh, like you said, in the future with the Biden administration and right now being very focused on COVID and safety, um, that's that's going to be something that they're going to continue. Yeah, and, and I mean, two thoughts. I mean, on, in terms of the future, I am hopeful that at some point, and actually Dr. Fauci has kind of made some rumblings that we might get some new CDC guidelines that um, kind of lets off, lets people off the hook for some of the more onerous things once they're vaccinated. But I don't know. I mean, with, with all the, the, the new uh, strains and vari variables out there, um, I just don't know whether we're going to get to a point where, you know, people in the workplace that have been vaccinated, let's say you have a department and everybody's been vaccinated, are they still gonna to have to continue to wear masks? Right now, OSHA is saying yes, because uh, 
that there's a, that some of the vaccines are effective at reducing illness, but not reducing, you could still be infected and spread it, even if you're vaccinated. And then we're gonna have issues, well, you, you, you got this early vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, or, or this particular vaccine, and it's not very effective against the South African strain or this other strain. So you could still get sick. And so even if you're vaccinated, there's still risk. Um, so I, I just don't know where we're gonna end up on that. I and mean, I mean, this, this could go on for quite some time. Um, I mean, that's probably the last thing people wanna hear, but um, I just don't know. And until we have some firm guidance as to where this is all headed, you know, I think OSHA is probably gonna mandate pretty, you know, a continuation of all of these strict measures until we get some handle on um, you know, what all that means. All right, next question. What are your thoughts on the national minimum wage? Where are you seeing it headed? So I'll, I'll jump in on this first and, and then David, you can come in with the legalities afterwards. But, um, you know, with, with the minimum wage, uh, you know, looking at the $15 mark, we're seeing that actually in the last, you know, previous prior years, um, some cities and some states have already implemented that, um, and so that's that's not new to them. But for especially, you know, in the food industries, you know, certainly we're not there. And so uh, what we're seeing with anticipation of rising minimum wage, whether it be up to eleven dollars or up to fifteen dollars, is um, companies are putting together compensation plans with um, gradual step increases. So eventually, you know, as, as employees gain skills or as they move up or uh, within a certain time period, they'll be able to meet, uh, you know, rise up to the level, whether it be 15 or $11 in the next uh, however many years that would be. So we are seeing some proactive initiatives taken on those uh, for some companies in the food industries. But like I said, some cities and states out there have already um, implemented those, those minimum wage standards um, in, in previous years. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo a lot of that. Um, I do think it's going to happen. I don't know that it's going to happen in the reconciliation bill they're talking about yeah. right now. Um, but it, I, I firmly believe we're going to see um, a, a new minimum wage from this administration in the next, you know, six months to a year. It'll probably be stair step. It's not going to jump straight to $15 immediately. It'll probably have a phase in over a period of time of a couple of years uh, is most likely. Um, so I think, you know, employers should prepare for, for that to happen. Um, and, you know, I think there's two things to think about. One, not only if you're below $15, you know, what that means about people moving up, but there's going to be that ripple effect. I mean, that's the problem with raising minimum wage is if you were you know, if an employee was $5 over minimum wage and they find themselves now, you know, 50 cents over minimum wage, they're going to expect to be bumped up as well. So it, it always has a ripple effect um, ac across wages, which usually creates, you know, inflationary pressure on products and prices. So, um, you know, I think that's going to happen. And, and, and I think it's, it's a good time to prepare for that. Um, in terms of the impact, I think it, as Quinn said, it really depends on where you're at. I mean, if you're, if you're on the West Coast or New York, this is not going to matter. It's just not that big of a deal because in those particular areas, um, you know, the wages are already that high. But if you're in, um, you know, rural Texas or Arkansas, that's a big deal. Um, it's possible that at the federal level, we may for the first time see some sort of regionalized minimum wage. I, I think that's unlikely just because of that will be very complicated. And, you know, they got enough on their plate to not try to figure out how to do that. I think we'll just see the continuation of just just one national minimum wage, but there's talk of that, of, of something, you know, more uh, keep, you know, taking into account the fact that, you know, wages in New York and, and, and Arkansas and Florida and, and, you know, should be different. Okay, we have one more question here. What advice or thoughts can you share for our members to be expecting in the next four years? You wanna go first, Quinn? Sure. Um, so in the, it's, it's hard to see the future. Uh, things change every day, <laughs> even as we're speaking right now, they, they're probably changing. But you know, with, uh, with looking out, of course, I think safety uh, concerns are gonna be a big deal moving forward, especially with the pandemic happening. So we certainly need to take all kinds of precautions with that. Um, and with safety, you, know, you certainly want to include incentives, uh, especially for, for you know, with COVID. For example, you know, include that as part of your, your safety initiatives, how some companies have safety programs and celebrate, you know, non-recordables and so forth. You, you can tie that in 
with uh, with injuries because uh, COVID, I guess, you know, once you test positive and, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it, it could be put down as a recordable um, if they're hospitalized and, and death results and so forth. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah, tying, tying that in with safety programs, looking at initiatives, um, and in the next four years, certainly, you know, employee involvement is going to be very important in terms of anything that you do, putting programs together, um, because right now with social, social media, they're, you know, click a keyboard and, you, you know, news spreads in an instant. And so, uh, you know, controlling communication, um, being able to get uh, involved in, and looking at the different, of course, technology. We, you know, we haven't touched on that even because of, of time, but technology is also very important moving forward in the future in terms of helping to, uh, you know, uh, either either in recruiting or, or contact tracing, for example, what we had talked about earlier. And also, you know, with, with a lot of things we do in terms of um, non-touching, um, being uh, helping employees to utilize programs that are, are self-service um, so that everybody can do this on their own, whether it be on their computer or iPad. So technology is going to be a big part of that. Um, using artificial intelligence later um, to help, you know, identify things to look for, whether it be in employee groups, candidates and analytics and so forth. Um, and, and also, you know, of course, diversity and inclusion moving forward is also going to be a big deal. I mean, it's, it's rising right now, but I think it's going to continue to have a strong force um, pulling after that. Yeah, and I'd echo a lot of the same things. I, I think, look, we, we, we have a Democrat president and a Democrat-controlled Congress. We haven't had that in a while. So I think what that means is we're going to see some new laws. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but, but I think we should expect um, that we will see a raise in minimum wage. We may see paid sick leave for the first time. You know, the things that have been sort of on the wish list are probably going to be passed. Um, and that's going to mean, you know, increased costs, I think, from labor costs for, for many, many employers. Um, we're going to see more inf uh, aggressive enforcement. You know, the, the truth is we haven't had very aggressive enforcement at the federal level um, in the last, you know, four years. I think that's going to change. I think OSHA is going to become much more aggressive and much more involved. Um, and I think, you know, the other agencies are going to follow along with that. Um, I, I think putting the legal stuff aside in terms of just practical things, I think, again, it's a very interesting time. I mean, it's been a very disruptive time, but that's also means opportunities. It means opportunities to evolve technologically in the workplace. It means opportunities to evolve, you know, utilizing um, different labor strategies for people working remotely. So I think it's a very exciting time to be an employer, um, to be creative and be flexible. And I think, as I said, I'll, I'll end this with, I think, you know, I don't want to be just Debbie Downer, right? I mean, there's, there's definitely going to be a, a more regulatory environment that we're going to be in. But I think there's also opportunities here for employers to be creative and maybe do things that they couldn't have done in the past. Awesome. Uh, we can't thank you all enough for, for tuning in with us today or helping. This is always such a, a hot topic, and you know that, David, <laughs> from, from many other conferences that you have spoken at with SMA. So um, Quinn and David, we cannot thank you all enough for coming and, or I guess virtually coming over and uh, speaking with us today. Thanks. It's Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. You too.